there's the soccer game, and you're supposed to be the snack parent, bringing the snacks to the game, and you're supposed to bring, I guess, I don't know, oranges or something <laughs> like that for the snack, and you get shamed if you bring candy or whatever. <laughs> I don't know, some kind of blue drink maybe you're supposed to bring, and an orange. And if you bring pretzels, maybe that's like you're a bad parent or whatever. What are you supposed to bring so that you're the good parent and you don't get like thrown out of the soccer club? <laughs> This is Fat Science, a podcast dedicated to the science of why we get fat. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice. I'm Dr. Emily Cooper. I've been treating patients with metabolic issues for over 25 years. I'm on a mission to raise awareness about metabolic dysfunction and why diets don't work. Hi, I'm Andrea Taylor. I've been fat, very fat, chubby, morbidly obese, and done almost every diet ever invented. They all worked until they didn't. I've known Dr. Cooper forever, but when I became her patient and we learned metabolism was the real problem, wow, everything changed, and I've never been healthier. And I'm Mark Wright. It's time for Fat Science. Wait, does this podcast make me look fat? Welcome to Fat Science. I'm your host, Mark Wright, along with Dr. Emily Cooper and Andrea Taylor. It's so great to see you two. Great Hi. to be here. Hi. Okay, I've been so looking forward to this episode because this is so relevant to so many of us. We're going to be talking today about fueling your workouts. And before you turn off the podcast, if you're thinking this is just for hardcore athletes or ultra athletes, no. We're going to be covering what to give your eight-year-old before their soccer game, what to do before you go to the gym, maybe a hike. So this is going to cover all aspects of what our body needs when you put it under exertion. So Dr. Cooper, why don't you set, set the playing field for us, so to speak, in terms of why fueling is something we really need to understand? Well, if you think about when you're trying to ask your body to put out that much exertion and that much effort, you need to give it the fuel to do it. It's just that simple. So if we don't bring in the energy in the, in the way of fuel, then our muscles won't have the energy to help us go faster or, you know, climb up that mountain or whatever it is that we're trying to ask our body to do. It's really interesting, Dr. Cooper, because when we think about the energy available to our body, it really gets complicated because it's not like a gas tank. A gas tank has one hole you put in gas, and then it goes through the carburetor into the engine, and it gets burned. But our bodies have all kinds of energy, stored energy, energy in the bloodstream. I mean, it gets super complicated. So why don't you break down sort of what the basic sources of energy are for our bodies? Yeah, and unlike a car, when our body is parked, it's still burning fuel. <laughs> you know, it doesn't just stop burning yeah. it because there's so many internal things that are going on that are constantly using energy. So there are different aspects of our metabolism. There's the, the basal metabolism, which is when we're really asleep and not doing anything. And that is when we use the least amount of energy, but we're still using quite a bit of energy. And then there's what's called the resting metabolism, which is we're awake, but just sitting and sedentary and, you know, quite at rest, but not fully asleep. And then the next level up is called physical activity expenditure, which is when you're just, you know, walking to the refrigerator or going up and down your stairs, doing your laundry, things like that. Then there's exercise metabolism, which is when you're actually working out or doing something that requires, you know, a higher heart rate or more level of exertion. So there's all those aspects. So where does the body like to get energy when we exercise? Really, the harder the efforts and the longer the efforts are, the more carbohydrates we need. So just sitting at rest, we may only, you know, we may be fine at like 40 to 50% of our calories coming in from carbs. But then as we amp up our energy expenditure in, way, in the way of our muscles having to do more work, we actually require more and more carbohydrates in the diet. So that's the fuel that should make up the difference. 
And if that effort also requires a lot of a strength component from our muscles, we also want to amp up the protein amounts to some degree, not crazy high levels like some people think, but just to amp it up a notch. And we've talked in previous episodes about if you don't fuel your workout, your body is going to find the energy somewhere. And, and it's not necessarily very good for you if your body has to go deep into your muscles and find some carbs or break down some amino acids. So it's not a very efficient way to, to find energy, is it, if you don't fuel, right? Right, exactly. If you don't provide that fuel that your body needs, whether it's like just to cover your resting expenditure or for that exercise expenditure, your body will have to find the fuel somewhere. And so we have a mass structure of our body. And within that structure, there's muscles, tendons, ligaments, and even skin, things like that, that contain proteins that we can actually break down and convert to amino acids and derive our glucose or carbohydrate fuel coming from that source. And so we're basically feeding off our body and feeding off our muscles, which we don't want to do. The other source of proteins that we can turn into carbs is our immune system. And so we obviously don't want to reduce our immunity either. So providing that fuel coming in preserves our body, enables it to stay strong, enables our immune system to stay healthy and does, you know, a gazillion other wonderful things for us. But how do you get the body to burn the fat? <laughs> That's what everybody's looking for. Yes. Good point. Good question. I mean, this is a bit of a rabbit hole, Dr. Cooper, but I, I feel... Andrea, that's a very valid question at this point. Well, I mean, that's what everyone's looking to do. Yeah, it's great. And so this is really counterintuitive too, but actually fueling your body with adequate carbs and other nutrients will help you burn fat, which sounds so weird. Right. Um, but there's kind of a weird uh, fad that I, I hope it's kind of died down now, but um athletes mistakenly thought that if they reduce their carbohydrate intake around their workouts, that they will somehow burn more fat. And there's a little, it, what happened here is there's a little science behind it, but again, it was completely misinterpreted as we often see. So what the science showed was if you starve your body of carbs around a workout, your muscles have no choice but to burn fats that are stored in the muscle as a fuel source. Those are called intramuscular triglycerides. Um, so not, not the belly fat. Exactly. Not the belly fat. Because <laughs> we normally store glycogen, which is what where the carbohydrates are. And that's the fuel that allows us to go fast and have a lot of power. Mm. But we also store intramuscular triglycerides, which provide fuel for endurance but it's kind of a slower burning type of thing. And so it doesn't give you that quick energy output. Output. So athletes are not paying attention. They're just kind of saying, let's cut out the carbs and we'll adapt our muscles to burn fat. Well, you know, that's not a good thing if your muscles are having to rely on fat when they really need carbs. And so then it actually slows the athlete down and you end up going a lot slower and your heart rates, um, end up, you know, not being able to tap into that high end of your fitness basically. So, so yeah. So to burn fat, you have to think of, well, what fat do we want to burn? <laughs> you know, and, um, what you don't want to do is send out starvation signaling throughout your body that makes you conserve energy and actually end up storing more fat. Wow. So as a man in his late fifties, um, I feel like if my body is going to start burning muscles and intramuscular fat. Um, I don't know if you guys have struggled with this, but I'm in my late fifties and my pants are kind of saggy on the backside, which means I've lost muscle back there. Yeah. And, uh, and well, <laughs> it's a common thing. I cannot afford to lose a pound of, of muscle yeah. at this point. Cause like you've talked about this, Dr. Cooper, and I, that was a stupid joke, no. but you've talked about, you've talked about this before though, that when you create muscle, that muscle uh, by default, um, burns calories just sitting there, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, and, you know, our lean mass is supposed to make up the majority of all of our mass in our body. <laughs> and it is responsible for the bulk of our metabolic expenditure. 
But, you know, the other interesting thing is if you get into that situation, Mark, like in your age, male, and you're cutting out carbs and you're starting to turn to your muscles for energy and all that stuff, it also is impacting your testosterone levels. You know, testosterone is a hormone that is very sensitive to fuel shortages, stressors, and it can actually start declining due to the same kind of pattern of your body being afraid that you're in a famine. And one reason is that testosterone gives males kind of a sense of security. Um, it's kind of a weird thing, but it, it, it reduces the male sense of threat in the environment and risk. Wow. Yeah. It's calm. It's actually a calming hormone contrary to what, what its image is. Right. Right. <laughs> sort of the roid rage, you yeah. know, reputation of it, but yeah. it, it promotes calmness. It, that's, that's why. It wild. does. It promotes calmness and um, less anxiety and more confidence. Um, but it also promotes um, more activity. Like it, it, it kind of increases your motivation and your motivation to do physical things, spend more energy, you know, build more muscle, burn more fuel. So your body as a way of conserving energy starts to decrease your testosterone output to try to help hmm. you conserve energy, to make you more tired so that you won't try to go out and do so many things. <laughs> like yard, yard work. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I could just blame my metabolism. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, honey. Not happening today. Yes. <laughs> We've all seen the kids at the game and there's the soccer game and you're supposed to be the snack parent bring in the snacks to the game and you're supposed to bring, I guess, I don't know, oranges or something <laughs> like that for the snack. And you get shamed if you bring candy or whatever. <laughs> I don't know, some kind of blue drink maybe you're supposed to bring and an orange. And if you bring pretzels, maybe that's like you're a bad parent or whatever. What are you supposed to bring so that you're the good parent and you don't get like thrown out of the soccer club. <laughs> I'm just imagining it. <laughs> I well, would bring, oh I would gosh. bring donuts. I, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, it would be bad. I, I would probably bring donuts and I would bring, I, I guess I would bring the oranges and maybe some nice juice or something <laughs> in the cute box that had animals on it or something. That's awesome. I, I don't know. I just, I wouldn't want to be shamed by the other parents, <laughs> I guess. Okay. Let's start though, Dr. Cooper, uh, with before the game or even the night before. Like, Oh, you got to give our kids the kids have, cause, stuff. You know, it's, it's usually an hour long game, sometimes 90 minutes, depending on, on the, you know, what, what level your kids are at soccer. But let's talk about pre- activity fueling for kids. Yeah. And so anytime you have your kids playing soccer or any kind of team sports, you have to think of a lot of things because their daily nutrition is still the most critical. Like what are they eating on a day-to-day -day basis regardless of their exercise? So do they skip breakfast? Because if they do automatically, they probably shouldn't be exercising in the first place. So we want to get that daily nutrition consistent without skipping meals and and just being very consistent. Then think about when, what time of day is that soccer practice going to occur? Mm -hmm. If it happens to fall in the mid afternoon, well, that might be good because they've already had lunch, you know, they've had their meals for the day and then it's not that, you know, they don't have a system that's running on empty, hopefully by the time it starts. But if it's first thing in the morning, and they are running out the door to get to practice, that's a little tricky because they are going into it without adequate pre-fueling. So then you have to look at the night before. Did they have a really good dinner? Did they have maybe a snack before bed? Can you at least get them to have a snack on their way out the door, a light breakfast, something in their system before they get going? And then during the workout, you'd have to make sure that they're fueling really well during the workout if it's especially first thing in the morning. Yeah. So, you know, I think some parents frown on energy, you know, Gatorade and, and drinks like that, but that's actually, do you think that's a decent thing to fuel during like, let's say halftime at a, at a soccer game? Yes. I mean, I think you really do have to include some 
easily consumable fuels. So you'll see a lot of things on the market. You know, there's the, what are called CES, carbohydrate electrolyte solutions. Those, um, we want to make sure that parents know that just the electrolyte solution alone is not really enough because it has no calories, no carbohydrates, no fuel. It's just replacing electrolytes lost in the sweat. So instead, you want to make sure that it has some source of carbohydrates. So a lot of people shy away because of the, quote, sugars in them. Right. Yeah, but there, it's you kind of need it because you're using it as a fuel. You're using glucose as you're exercising. You're using carbohydrates that are stored either in the liver or the muscles. And then if you don't consume something while you're using those, your stress hormones will start increasing and you'll actually not be able to keep up with the activity level. So Andrea's idea of bringing donuts is actually not not that. <laughs> so it's not so bad. It's, it's actually not that bad, but it is a little bit heavy to eat during something like that. Maybe graham right. crackers or a sandwich. Yeah, or a peanut butter jelly sandwich um, right. for that kind of halftime type of thing when you are able to consume more than just the sports drink. But you also have to think when you're exercising, you do really need to balance your fluids with your fuel because otherwise your stomach will get upset. So say mm. you don't drink enough water and you're just consuming solid foods or sweets and things like that or a concentrated, a concentrated sports drink, your stomach, yeah, your stomach will get upset. So it has to be a right. certain composition. And a lot of these off-the-shelf um, sports drinks know that. Like, there's a huge amount of technology it, that goes into these sports, you know, some of the, you know, more popular sports drinks. And so usually they are mixed at the right concentration um, if you just drink them as is. And um, you can find some that are the ones that aren't, you know, don't have a lot of food coloring and don't have a lot of added chemicals. And there are some brands, you know, that, uh, that are out there that are better than others. Yeah. Well, that's really, I mean, I'm glad Andrea that you brought that up, the, the sort of food shaming, because uh, I don't know that it's like, you know, super critical, but there is this attitude among parents, I think all of us, that if you bring something other than orange wedges or some other, you know, grapes or something like that, that you're somehow doing a disservice to, to our children as they're out there on the field, but having like graham crackers and juice or graham crackers and, and an energy drink. Wow, that's that that seems like it would be good fuel. Right? I think kids would eat that. Yeah, I mean, because you also have the kids who maybe they don't want to eat all those health, you know, the so called healthy. Well, and, snacks. and oranges like are so might, messy. Sorry, I mean it's oh, messy and gross, and the oh kids are gosh. sticky and. Yeah. I mean, it's good to have a variety. I, mean, I like an orange. I'm not against oranges. <laughs> yeah. It's good to have a variety of things. I think available so they could choose what they want. Yeah, um, but. Uh, I've even seen like cut up potatoes and stuff like that. And those are, wait, a, yeah. A raw potato? No, no, what? cooked potatoes. Yeah. Oh. oh. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And kids like them. I mean, you know, if they're, if they're hung, I mean, they're working out like if that. It's a French fry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they'll, they'll pretty much consume, <laughs> you know, what looks good and that'll give them the fuel that they need. And they're just burning a lot of fuel. And the other thing to keep in mind is, it doesn't matter if they are a child with a high body weight or a low body weight. They all need the fuel. Right. That's yeah. a really good point, too. So let's, Dr. Cooper, talk about, I want to just cover like a, a basic workout. So I think there are probably two types of people listening who just exercise on a regular basis. One might do some aerobic exercise or a walk or jog for maybe 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And somebody else might be pretty hardcore about lifting weights uh, on a regular basis and really stressing the body from, from a weight standpoint. So can you address what fueling those two workouts would look like? Yeah. I mean, someone who's doing a general fitness aerobic kind of workout for a half hour a day or most days of the week, those workouts typically don't need any special specific fueling strategy. They can be just blended into your day where in the course of the day, you are you would consume more than you would on a day that you don't do any activity, but you don't have to ha implement like a pre-workout, during workout, post-workout type of fueling strategy. You just have to make sure you have breakfast within an hour of waking up, you eat every few hours throughout the day. 
you know, your normal routine. And, you know, if you're somebody though, who's doing a more serious kind of training, um, and there you're, you're maybe incorporating some longer workouts with heavy weight training, some kind of strength component that's maybe even mixed with aerobic or a sport that takes you out there for longer. Once you start hitting like an hour long duration, that's where you have to really start thinking, okay, I need to do something pre-workout, during, and post-workout would be the ideal situation. Um, and if it, there's a big strength component, you still want to get the carbs, you know, during the workouts and after, but you also might consider adding more protein to your diet because that helps your muscles after you do a strength workout, your muscles break down before they build back up stronger. So you adding that protein in gives it the ingredients to build up stronger. And what they find is if you do it actually um, for a snack before bed on the days that you do the strength workout, if you boost the protein content of your PM snack before you go to bed, that it really does help your muscles um, use that protein more for that muscle recovery and building that back up. Let's talk about you finish the workout now, should you replenish? Do you got to put something back into your body? That's a great question. The post-workout, we call it a post-workout window, is just a really magical time where if you catch that window, you can actually restock your muscles with energy very efficiently. If you miss the window, it could, it could take up to four days. It could take up to four days to actually restore what you could have if you if you actually fueled immediately after the workout. So the window, it's like a two hour window, and it the optimal fueling would be to within a half an hour after the workout have one meal or snack there. Is this is this why they always have like smoothies at the gym or something like that that's you know maybe has yogurt in it or milk or something like that that would have sort of protein and maybe like some pro or protein powder and maybe some fruit in it. Yeah, I think you're right that's the concept of it, but actually the better fuel to have would be like a bagel. Um oh because you need a higher carbohydrate, it's mainly the carbohydrates that you really need, not so much the protein, a little bit of protein, but you need the carbohydrates there. And um, protein is definitely helpful. But if you don't, if you have something that's kind of weak on the carb side, it's not really achieving that refueling and restocking of your muscles. Hmm. But that's so yeah. good to know. Yeah. And that first one, it, it's at within 30 minutes, and there's a second meal or snack within two hours. So if you hit both of those, it's good. But yeah, other things like post-workout, you want to make it something really convenient that you can carry with you. Wow. So Dr. Cooper, I think there was a study done not too long ago that said that chocolate milk and the balance between carbs and protein in chocolate milk made it a, a pretty ideal post-workout. I, I tend to be sort of leery because ever since... <laughs> Pork is the other white meat yeah. campaign came out. I was like, hmm, are, is this really true? <laughs> right. <laughs> but is chocolate milk, is that a decent post-workout uh, thing to have? It, it actually really is. I still think you need to add some more carbs to it um, because what that was based on is there was some science years back where they thought that, yes, the carbs are the most important, but they also thought that adding a certain amount of protein would help your muscles absorb the carbs better. But it turned out that it wasn't really true, um, <laughs> but that the protein still was beneficial for other reasons, you know, because it just, again, helps your muscles with the muscle recovery and starts to get ahead of that. So I think that there was a little bit of overemphasis on post-workout protein years ago when that those studies came out. But still, chocolate milk is a great thing, and you can have it without having to be refrigerated. So that's what's great, too. Hmm. So... Um, the reason chocolate milk versus regular is the regular doesn't have enough car enough sugar, <laughs> basically. So chocolate milk plus maybe the bagel or the you know or something a milk and cookies, <laughs> something and cookies. yeah something like that that gives you more of a carb boost. And we're talking about workouts that are you know longer, like that soccer workout, soccer practice, or like the the um, heavier duty 
strength and cardio combined that's longer, um, or some kind of a long hike or a running, you know, workout, stuff like that. That's where you need those post-workout fuel. Is there anything that having, you know, for in the morning, anything that coffee and tea does to your morning situation, to your workouts, like having coffee and tea changes anything? Well, if you're, a, a, you know, if we're talking about caffeine, um, yeah. well, if you're a habitual caffeine drinker, it mm-hmm. doesn't really make a difference. But if you're not normally a caffeine drinker and then you have it, it actually can enhance your uh, neuromuscular activity, like your responsiveness, basically. It makes you your muscles more alert. But if we're used to drinking it, it doesn't actually give us right. that benefit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Yeah. Because in my, in my well, my wife doesn't drink coffee, but I really think coffee is one of the major food groups. I do too. <laughs> and it's absolutely necessary in the morning. I think we should cover, Dr. Cooper, the time of day because- Boy, like pickleball has become such a rage these days. Uh, when people have the opportunity to plan their exercise or their exertion, what's the best strategy? Well, if we had all the opportunity, which probably is not realistic for most people, but ideally we'd want to have consumed food twice during the day before we do that workout. So I always say like breakfast and then a morning snack at minimum before you go do your workout, just so that you get past that fasting window, enough past that, that you're not going to shock your metabolism. There have been studies that showed um, if you don't eat enough prior to the workout, again, we're talking about the same hormones. Your leptin after the workout is much lower. Your ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone that disrupts metabolism, is much higher than it would be if you had really good fueling prior to the workout. So it's hard to get great fueling when you're doing these workouts first thing in the morning because you've been just recovering from an overnight fast. I think we need to talk about trail mix. We (laughs) talked about it uh, off camera just before. (laughs) Because the name makes it sound, Dr. Cooper, like it's the perfect snack for the mountains of uh, the Pacific Northwest. Right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I mean, like, think about uh, trail mix. Well, at least the kind of trail mix I get at Costco <laughs> is, uh, you know, M and M's, uh, peanuts, uh, almonds, uh, stuff like and that. Oatmeal-y stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's actually good. I mean, it, it's a good. Uh, I, I kind of like it when our patients have trail mix around because it's the easy thing to eat. Just have a handful of it, you know, for snacks and stuff during the day. You don't have to be on the trail, but, but just to, to at least get an easy snack in. Um, but it is, you know, decent, but it's, it is funny to think of eating that when you're working hard, you know, and trying to, to grab that out of your backpack. (laughs) But I think if you're on a leisurely hike, it does make sense to have trail mix on the trail. It does. Um, so Dr. Cooper, I have some friends who are pretty serious bicyclists and it makes me wonder, you know, I'll say, Oh, what'd you do today? Oh, I rode my bike 50 miles or 30 miles. And it's like, these are long bike rides, you know, several hours long to, to, to the person who has that kind of a workout, what's the best thing to take with them? And like, how often should you fuel if you have one of those multi-hour workouts? That's a great question. Yeah. That's a whole, uh, science and it's actually real quite, quite straightforward. It's very easy. There's a formula actually, but a lot of people aren't aware of it. And so they get into trouble where their muscles run out of energy during the last part of the ride or, um, their stomach gets really upset. So the thing to do there is the best way to approach it. If you're that serious of an athlete, you start with what we call a sweat test. So you have to start by finding out how much you sweat (laughs) because everyone has a different sweat rate. And as I described before, your stomach needs to have a certain kind of concentration of fluid versus fuel. And so knowing the sweat rate allows you to kind of estimate, well, how much fluid first do we need? And then that can tell us how much fuel you can have without upsetting your stomach. (laughs) So it's also depends on how much you're, you're able to consume. So if you're sitting on a bicycle there's a whole nother thing. It's not like running and you have your water bottle. 
you have to be able to grab your fuel easily, whether it's coming from bottles or it's those like blocks of fuel or goo (laughs) or whatever it is. You have to be able to Mm -hmm. open it and consume it while you're riding. And um, the best time to start fueling while you're on a ride like that is within 10 minutes of the start of the ride to get to start because you have an hourly requirement. So you, you break it down and you say, okay, each hour I need this many grams of carbohydrates. I need this many ounces of fluid. And you have to actually keep that up with various formulas that you can come up with. But then as the hours go on, if say you're in your third hour, then you really need to be adding more than just carbohydrates and fluids. You've got to get some actual real food in there um, or bars, things that have protein and fats as well. And you even need some more things like magnesium, calcium to offset your sweat losses. So it becomes kind of more scientific when you're doing that. Um, but it's it once you, you kind of know the numbers, it's pretty easy to come up with the formula. So you know, it, most people do it with some type of a sports drink, then, you know, if they're doing it responsibly, then they would also have something more solid for the really longer events. Um, and then adding in some calcium, magnesium, if they need to do that too, to keep your muscle contraction going. And then there's the pre-workout fuel, there's the post-workout fuel. So it's a fuel, 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 but you start with that sweat test where you, to do it, it's real easy. You take, you have to get naked and you do have to have that evil scale. You have to, you have to have a scale. So you do your naked weight on a scale and you have to use the same scale after the workout, but then you do a workout for in the conditions that you think you'll normally be in it for an hour and you cannot void or drink anything during that period of time. Or if you do, you have to measure that too. (laughs) And then afterwards, you dry off all the sweat off your body, including your hair, and you stand on that same scale naked. And then you look at that weight difference. And so for every pound that you lost, that's 16 ounces of water that you lost in the sweat of sweat, basically. Hmm. And so then, so if you, if it turns out you lost a liter of fluid in that one hour, that is going to be really hard to keep up those fluid demands and it will catch up with you by that third hour. If you're not actually keeping up with that much fluid intake, then by the third hour, you'll notice your heart rates going up and your powers going down. So, you know, some of these rides are leisurely, but some of them are pretty serious <laughs> with these groups of guys and women in your age group, <laughs> our age group. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's so so there's a whole science to it, but it's it's actually pretty fun. But a lot some people don't pay attention to it, and that's where you're going to get into trouble with that muscle breakdown, testosterone dropping. Um, for women, you'll you'll end up with increasing body fat typically because of the you know the problems with the metabolic system. I'd love to ask about carbo loading, Dr. Cooper, because ever since I was a kid, it was like, well, I've got this big thing tomorrow. I better have a big plate of uh, spaghetti or pasta the Uh night before. Is carbo loading a thing? I mean, scientifically, is is there some evidence that having carbs the night before a big exertion is a good thing? Yes, there is. Absolutely. Yep. Um, You know, in fact, the opposite, not having them impaired will lead to impaired performance. But yes, having them in there, it has to be about four hours or more prior to the workout if it's a solid food. Um, If it's a smoothie that you've kind of put, again, smoothies, you have to have the carbs. So you might have to put, believe it or not, like dry oats in there. Like, I know I knew Andrea wouldn't like that one. <laughs> How does it come through the straw? <laughs> well, you blend it up and people don't don't oh, notice it. Oh, it just oh, 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 it oh. kind of gives it like a thickness and especially I wasn't thinking. Especially if you use like the instant oats, you know, more right. the I wasn't thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping we wouldn't get to blended food until I was at the rest home. So uh... <laughs> but if you do it in the form of a smoothie, it can be reduced down to like two to three hours um, before it can get to your muscles. So the point is get it to the muscles. And so you need at least four hours for solid food, two to three for like that liquid. And 
I know some athletes that um, have really early workouts or competition where they just blend up some smoothie like that. And while they're going to the bathroom (laughs) in the early hours of the morning, they just down it so that it's in their system when they formally wake up Hmm. in the morning. Right. I always thought that was the nicest thing about the New York City Marathon was the spaghetti dinner the yeah. night before. I was like, well, it's still not going to convince me that running <laughs> is a thing, but I might go to the spaghetti dinner. <laughs> but- I love it. So, Dr. Cooper, we touched on something before that I think is super important, and that is some kids uh, who struggle with their weight, we shouldn't judge those kids when it's time for to fuel at soccer practice or to fuel before the swim meet doesn't matter, does it, in terms of body shape, body size, when it comes to fueling your workout, does it? No, it absolutely does not. Those kids need that same amount of fuel. And in fact, they're probably more prone to having problems with their metabolism if they don't receive the fuel, because they already are sort of at a disadvantage metabolically. So yes, um, and it's a hard, you know, it's it's opposite of what people often think, and they single out these kids and they say, well, yeah. you know, you don't need that much, and and that's yeah. just so not true. They do need it. Well, this has been super informative, Dr. Cooper. I think we've learned a lot about just how we fuel our bodies when it's time to exert, and it really depends, doesn't it, in terms of who it is, when it is, and what it is that we eat. Yeah, exactly. Dr. Emily Cooper, Andrea Taylor, thanks so much for another edition of Fat Science. Fat Science. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better. See you next week. I'm Mark Wright. Thanks for listening to Fat Science with Dr. Emily Cooper, a Work P2P production. New episodes drop every Monday. If you've enjoyed the conversation, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. This production is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice. Join us next week for another episode dedicated to the science of why we get fat. No diets, no agendas, just science that makes you feel better.